April 2, 2005, a Baton Rouge native and upcoming rapper by the name of Ivy Smith was in anticipation for the night to come. Known to his peers in the music industry by the alias Lil Ivy, everyone knew that night was about to be something special because that night was before his birthday, April 3, 2005. Lil Ivy was a known high roller and someone well respected and connected in the underworld of the community. His dealings have been connected to criminal elements like supplying coke along with being involved in disputes and shootouts with his rivals. He had the finances to have a party of luxury to usher in his birthday, and that's exactly what he did. The venue was Club Shenanigans in Baton Rouge. It was a club Little Ivy was no stranger to. In fact, in rare videos of his life, he can be seen outside the venue with his peers having a grand time socializing and representing the area he called home, the south side of the city. Bro, it's real like that, dog. Chill. You know what I'm saying? Nigga so love right here, dog. So that night, Lil Ivy arrived at the club, and it was shaping up to be a party to remember. But it would be the last birthday party he lived to see. Allegedly, there was an altercation between Lil Ivy and others at the club, which led to a fight breaking out. Now, this isn't something unheard of given the environment, plus mixed with liquor and probably other paraphernalia. But the problem was that some of these brawls are sparked by rivals leaking in from the streets or gang associates and can turn detrimental in the aftermath. Sadly, for Lil Ivy, this evidently went in the direction of one of those tragic outcomes. April 3rd would arrive as midnight passed welcoming his birthday. Lil Ivy would leave the club after the event that led to the altercation. With him were his friends Kevin Henderson, also known as Ace, and Joshua Thomas, also referred to as Josh. The next time anyone saw the three of them, they would all be lifeless. Early that Sunday morning on April 3rd, reports by Detective Robert Schilling states that a uniformed patrol officer was northbound on Sherwood Forest when he noticed a car crashed into a pillar at the bank and turned around to investigate the accident. When he got closer to the scene, he realized it wasn't an accident, but the scene was where a crime occurred. Looking into the vehicle, he saw three individuals, 25-year-old Ivy Smith, 26-year-old Kevin Henderson, and 23-year-old Joshua Thomas, all with shots on their bodies. Investigators determined that the scene appeared to be due to someone pulling up alongside the vehicle and opening fire. Furthermore, they were connecting the altercation at the club shenanigans that happened prior. Reports state that Kenya Jaron, Ivy Smith's sister, was at the club that night and was also present at the scene after the assassination. According to her, once she realized her brother was laying on the ground, she immediately ran by his side and started to give him CPR. Sadly, both little Ivy and Kevin Henderson passed away at the scene while Joshua Thomas was transported to the hospital fighting for his life. Unfortunately, he too succumbed to his injuries, only able to keep on breathing for two days before his heart stopped, as recalled by his mother. Lil Ivy's life came to a tragic end. What was meant to be a memorable night, welcoming another year around the sun, turned into a sad ending that cut short his celebration and his dreams of channeling his life experiences into the music industry. This wasn't the only time Club Shenanigans was in the headlines for bloodshed and the loss of life. Seems in the past, the club also had altercations with patrons. It didn't stop with Lil Ivy. On June 9, 2013, the Baton Rouge Police Department reported a shooting outside Club Shenanigans around 2 a.m. Investigators said Jackson was sitting in the passenger seat of a vehicle when she was injured. She was taken to a hospital where she later passed away from her injuries. A second person was also shot, but those injuries were non-life-threatening. Eventually, the club was permanently shut down and only the remnants of its dilapidated structure tell of the past it once had. After Lil Ivy's passing, law officials were hot on the case for several reasons, not only because of their duty to uphold the law and bring perpetrators to justice, but knowing Lil Ivy's connection and lifestyle in Baton Rouge, his passing wouldn't stop there. Fear of retaliation, causing more harm, was constantly on their minds. 
so something had to be done, and fast. Unfortunately, to this day, their case remains unsolved. The last updated report details surfaced online on December 22, 2005, with details that appear to shed some light on what may be a lead to break the case open. Two weeks after their passing, another sad moment turned up two suspects and a gun. The gun was matched to the triple homicide, but the two suspects from the later assassination were behind bars at the time, so investigators concluded that somebody must have passed them the gun. It was a ray of hope for the families and friends who had their loved one life ripped from their side. That hope would dwindle. As the years without any further update, on what became of the new evidence, much less the case. The law appeared to be at a roadblock, but the streets spoke, and after a while, the speculations grew louder and louder about what might have happened that night leading to Little Ivy's passing. His nephew and rapper, Lit Yoshi, went on live on his Instagram account with information that shocked everyone tuned in. The target of his verbal attack was a surprising individual, Lil Boosie, aka Boosie Badass, that's the reason why Ivy ain't invite you to shenanigans, nigga. That was surprising because Boosie and Lil Ivy were like brothers and held a close bond. Boosie was there when Lil Ivy founded the movement TBG, which stood for Top Boy Gorillas. The group developed a rivalry with the opposing group who dubbed themselves Bottom Boy Gorillas, aka BBG. Even with how close Boosie and Ivy appeared, According to Lit Yoshi, Boosie was the one responsible for Lil Ivy's demise. I think because about a, a signing, I think because I forgot what really exactly what it was. I don't want to lie to y'all. It was about something about a something about a deal or something. It was something dealing with something, something like that. And it was acting like a chain will answer the phone or whatever, something like that. He further stated that what really happened was Trill Entertainment, the label that signed Boosie since back in the day wanted to sign Lil Ivy, but Boosie was basically blocking the deal and Lil Ivy cut ties with him for it. That night Ivy lost his life, Lit Yoshi said Boosie ran from the fight that broke out leaving Ivy to fend off the attackers after Lil Ivy refused his bottle of liquor given as an apology. Yeah, I haven't stopped f***ing with you tonight, you You came to the club yourself trying to give a pint of serve, trying to say you sorry. that, yeah. Be trying to be trying to be trying to man the internet a fool you my yeah all y'all be steady asking me do no my nah stepped under TBG was bad as NT TBG is boosting muscle well was boosting muscle I ain't saying I, I wasn't boosting muscle I was little I was a baby but you know I've been around as a baby I know the real wrong with a man should be pissing me out yeah tell why I haven't stopped f***ing with you. I don't really, what, what, what's the reason? I think it was because of something about, I think because about a, a signing, I think because I forgot what really, exactly what it was. I don't want to lie to y'all. It was about something about a, something about a deal or something. It was something dealing with something, something like that. And nigga was acting like a bitch ain't want to answer the phone or whatever, something like that. Some, yeah, Trill wanted to sign Ivy. Yeah, that's what it was. Wanted to sign Ivy and Boots ain't won't answer the phone. Those statements line up with those of Lil Ivy's son, Lil Ivy Jr., who claimed Boosie just wanted Lil Ivy's spot for himself. You say, when well, Ivy, you got top rank. That's what you wanted. As if this wasn't enough speculation and theory into Lil Ivy's passing, his daughter also posted a video and post addressing their grievances with Boosie as well. But yeah, I'm just tired of the disrespect. Somebody going to like, you need to put some respect on my daddy's name. Like, you talk about that's your boss man, the man who did this for you and did all that for you. But you, you don't, you don't, you don't even check on his people. Come correct and walk lightly when you, when it's about, when it's about my daddy. Cause he got his crazy ass little girl. He got his crazy ass little girl that's going to go retarded behind him every time. The fallout between Lil Ivy's family and Boosie trickled over onto his son. Tootie Raw, who made a statement to Lil Ivy Jr. on his track, Effed Up, making it clear he moved with bad boys and doesn't associate with any gorillas, 
referring to Ivy's creation, TBG. Ivy Jr. kept the back and forth going, releasing a track titled 45 with the lyrics, how my daddy was your partner, but you want to beef with us. Hold on, wait, I know what it is. He D riding snakes. So when we catch his ah, we gonna F up that boy's face. And Yoshi, that's my evil twin. We spray that B like mace. Y'all acting like y'all hard, but them BBGs is That's why when we catch your ah, we gonna hit you with that K. Soon the talks began escalating into harmful events and sad endings. He appeared to be going down the same road as his father, Lil Ivy. When my sister, I was playing basketball, but I see you for one stop. So I stopped playing basketball, picked up the stick and the mic. So what up? Luckily, after things began spiraling, it appears that Lil Ivy Jr. and Boosie Badass had finally made amends when they released the music video for their joint song, Real Nick's Back, which featured videos of Lil Ivy. As a father, I'm assuming he wouldn't want the same life he lived for his children and would welcome his son choosing peace rather than more pain for the family. Other affiliates of Boosie and Lil Ivy, like Zay, recalls how close they were and couldn't see Boosie having a hand in Lil Ivy's demise and was happy Lil Ivy Jr. and Boosie reasoned out their problems. But after being around Ivy, that could turn into the boss man, like, you know what I'm saying? To this day, Boosie continues to remember Lil Ivy and his friends lost back in the day through online memories and songs pouring his grief like pain and Lil Ivy gone, where he talks about feeling heartless and cold after Ivy's passing and feeling the guilt of arriving a little too late to make the difference in his friends surviving or passing. Apart from Boosie, who was blamed for Lil Ivy's passing, another rapper that lived in the street life by the name of Nusi was also named as the one responsible for Ivy's passing. He was known to be disrespectful and reckless, so it came as no surprise when he released a song speaking on the allegations that he ended Lil Ivy's life to taunt Boosie, whom he also had a rivalry with. Noosey soaked up the attention and made light of the situation, so people started taking that as a sign that he did in fact have a hand in Ivy's tragedy. Noosey was also later assassinated and detectives labeled Boosie as the one responsible, stating that he paid his hitman, Michael Marlo Mike Louding, to carry out the deed. Another affiliate of Lil Ivy, named Big Head, the Dome Doctor, later did an interview speaking on telling Noosey to not feed into the allegation that he ended Lil Ivy's life, but Noosey didn't listen. So many lost their lives in the wake of Lil Ivy's homicide, Another sad realization of how quickly things in that lifestyle can escalate and leave a trail of bloodshed among people that had so much potential and talent. Rest in peace, Lil Ivy.